Can we see? Yes. All right. So at SPEC, we are envisioning the future of, of healthcare. Um, and the emphasis here is on, right? Because we are looking at the eye as the gateway to your health. And so today, you know, I've been and to the whole team for inviting me here to talk about how technology has changed the healthcare industry. And specifically, I'll, my talk will be uh, talking about how it's changing the healthcare industry and care. Um, and so just a little bit of background for everyone, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, where we are looking to as the modern day tricorder. So if there are any Star Trek fans out there, you know, they create this device that you scan, you know, the whole body and you get a lot of information about the whole body, that's where you know, we as companies see ourselves go. So let's start with just a little bit of background about the eye and the retina. This might not be, you know, everyone. When we're looking at the retina. That really is the backside of the eye, um, you know, and so that is the layer where a lot of all the light focuses on at the back of your eye and enables you to see. Right. So when you see something, you're focusing, you're looking at your you're looking at yourself in the mirror, that light goes through and travels through the pupil of your eye, the front of your eye and lands in the back um, on the macula. So that there in the dark in the back, that's the photosensitive part of your retina where um, where you have, you know, your rods and your cones. And so if you look at the retina, you know, the retina. This is what we can see when it's imaged by Fundus camera. It's uh, components, and you know I really want you to focus on these because that's kind of what will give you the sense of what we are doing with retinal images and being able to use it as the tricorder. So you can see here on this image on the right, um, you have the optic disc and the optic cup, and you are coming out of there. That's really the socket that plugs into you know, you know your brain. So when you've seen those images of eyes just dangling, hanging on from from a thread, that's really where the connection is between the rest of you and your eye. Um, and then a little bit further out on the right, right, as I mentioned earlier, that's really where all the light focuses on in the back of your eye. And so um, when you're looking at things. Yeah, that's where all the light goes. And this is why it's a little bit darker black because it's absorbed all of that light. Um, and then see these blood vessels, you know, both arteries and veins that feed you know, the blood and the energy that it needs to operate. Um, and then hidden in here too, a nerve, the nerves that transmit the information back from the fovea and the macula back to, to you know, your brain so you can interpret and understand what you are looking at. Um, and then if anyone has any questions, please uh, please feel free to that window at any time, um, you know, and I can go through things in more detail. And so why are we looking at the retina? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the retina is really this wonderful space where you can see blow, both the blood vessels and the nervous system, the, the vein. Uh, you can see this from the exterior in a way that is non-invasive. So in reality, what you're getting is you're getting a biopsy um, without needing to do anything invasive. And fundus imaging is, is a great way to ask that. And what we have call it is the check and light of your body, right? And so in your body, it will show up first and foremost in your, your eye. You can see three different images. That pro these are the last... Uh, images of the retina. So hopefully you know, we won't be grossed out from, from these for the rest of the presentation. We can see on the left, this is what a normal healthy retina looks like, and blood vessels that are feeding into it. Um, in the middle here, you can see that there are a little bit of blood vessels, little red spots, blood spots, and um, white spots. And that those are hemorrhages. So the blood vessels are leaking. Um, and you know, in this case, doesn't affect your vision yet, but if left treated, start to creep towards the macula, uh, lose your vision, and that's most of the time when people will show up to the, you know, to the eye doctor, to the ophthalmologist. Um, and then over here on the right, you can see that you know big lesion, retinal detachment. This could be caused from you know, a variety of of different factors, whether 
you know, playing with laser pointers and you're burning a scar in the back of your eye or, you know, trauma or cancer, things like ways that, you know, the retina will show up and act as that, you know, cannery in the coal and let you know that something's not right with the body um, before you know, before the body really reacts and has any adversity. We see the retina and the eye as as a future of healthcare. Um, so a little bit of history. So how do you get that retinal image? Well, this started, you know, not that long, a few years ago, where the classic ophthalmoscope was created. This is the device you see on the left. And surprisingly enough, you just have one of these devices on the wall. You know, if you if you picture the last time you went to your family doctor's office, they have it hanging on the wall. There's three things, one that they can measure your blood pressure with, one that they'll stick your ear to look at. And the third one is this, this item here. The one on the right side is the ophthalmoscope. Now, unfortunately, you know, not many physicians and family doctors will actually pick up the this device, given that it's not that easy to use, and second of all, once they do see in the back of your eye, they don't really understand, you know, what at times they'll just let that go. And, and if you show up to your family doctor and you're like, hey, I'm having vision issues, you know, they'll just say, let's, let's refer you to the specialist and they'll take a look. Now, when you go to the ophthalmologist or the optometrist, right, your eye specialist, they'll use what is a little bit larger it's this device right here in the middle um, but as you can imagine you know very large very cumbersome and I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience where you get your head you know shoved into the the stand you know with the chin and the forehead and and then this big intimidating machine comes to your eye and and captures images um you've go, been going since then in the early 2000s, there's been this revolution of, you know, moving towards more portable, transportable things. And now we have what is called the mobile retinal camera. Um, basically, you know, some sort of handheld device. It could be cell phone based or other electronics, a couple of lenses and being able to just the patient's eye and capture images. So it's a, you know, maybe a little bit more parallel to the stethoscope of the eye. Now, where the interest has come and, and where AI really has shined started a few years ago. Let's see. Uh, so using AI in the retina, this started really in 2018 was really when we had the big explosion and in interest in using uh, AI and looking at, you know, the back of your eye and being able to predict things that extend beyond eye care. Uh, Google really sent shockwaves through the AI and the medical community the back of your eye and do a lot of cool predictions, uh, both on the cardiovascular side and other places. So if you can see here, you know, this is the paper that they publish in Nature Biomedicine. They're able to predict the age, the gender, you know, if the patient was smoking or not, what their age, uh, their body mass index was. And this is really, you know, as I mentioned earlier, sent shockwaves through the healthcare system because you can ask your eye doctors, right, whether it's your optometrist, your ophthalmologist, or even your retina specialist that spend all day, every day, get an image of a retina and predict, you know, the age or the gender of the patient, they would get it wrong 99% of the time. You know, for gender, they'd get it wrong 50% of the time. They'd be guessing. To us as humans, there is nothing obvious or differentiating between a male or female machine learning and AI, and you feed it a large enough database, that's when you're able to pick some of things up. And, you know, I, I like to draw the comparison between retina and uh, your genome, right, your DNA, where your DNA has a lot of information encoded into it also, but we as humans on its own, looking at all those, you know, the A, the T's, the G's, and the C's, we can't differentiate, you know, if you're going to be Asian, if you're going to be African American, or if you'll have blonde hair or dark hair, you know, blue eyes, we can't tell that from our eyes. But with machine learning and AI and a large enough data set, these things become obvious and very clear. 
Um, so just to show you, so some of these are some of the results that Google had published. I um, mean, you can actually see pretty good correlation between what was predicted and what the actual results were. So on the left here, you can see uh, the prediction of age. Y axis is the predicted age, and then on the X axis is the actual age. A pretty good correlation. You know, there's some variance in the predicted age, and in that you know, because we all age at different speeds, you know, some, some, sometimes, you know, people where their biological clock might look younger or older than their, um, similarly here on the right, we can look at the, uh, blood pressure prediction. So prediction of blood pressure is the actual, uh, blood pressure, a little bit less correlation here. It seems, you know, the AI is, uh, pressing them all into the central band. Um, but uh, again, this is, based on a sm fairly small subset uh, data set in like, research. So if we look at you know, some of what they were able to predict, you know, very predictive p-value, you know, well below 0.001% um, for everything from age, so blood pressure, so SDP and deep BP is uh, the systolic and the uh, dialysis blood pressure. Your body, your BMI, your uh, body mass index, and then your HbA1c. This is an indication of, you know, of diabetes body. So very predictive in being able to pre um, to predict where you are. Now, what you know, being able to predict the age, the gender, the blood pressure, you know, it's cool, but it's not really clinically useful. Right. If I'm close enough to you to capture an image of your eye, there are ways that I can look and determine your age and your gender um, through other means. But what this really has opened the door to the research community is that they're like, hey, there's a lot of information actually that's encoded into the eye. And we've seen a slew of articles being published every day looking at, you know, as I mentioned, systemic downs already understood. Good, but looking at cardiovascular disease, so predicting heart attack or stroke or other uh, adverse cardiac events. We're looking at the neurological side of things. So being able to predict uh, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, sorry, that's supposed to be Alzheimer's, not stroke, or even in the nephrology side, so looking at chronic kidney disease. So really anything that affects you know, your nerve or affects your cardiovascular system, your blood vessels, you know, will show up in the eye. And you know, we as humans don't really know what it is. You know, maybe your blood vessels are a little bit bigger. They're a little bit more red. Um, we don't know how to interpret it. But again, with machine learning and AI, the, the algorithms have identified this and with shockingly good accuracy. Um, so here are some, you know, some of the, the recent news articles that we've seen, you know, in the last few years. Right, you know, if you look at the first one, Google's new AI algorithm able to predict heart disease by looking at your eyes, um, you know, able to predict Alzheimer's disease, you know, early warning of, of Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, being able to retinal imaging, being able to predict likelihood of stroke, and even you know, things as crazy as COVID-19, right? Maybe you're able to detect fever, high blood, um, higher temperature, things like that. Now, actually, you know, this has all been academic research setting yet. And here at SPEC, we asked ourselves the fundamental question of like, how do we translate this from an academic setting to be used in a clinical setting, right? Where we can actually use this information into every day to help them make better decisions in life. Um, and the second question has been, how do we capture annotated high quality data, right? A lot of this data lives in university institutions and you know big reason why google's first paper showed only things about age and sex and blood pressure is had access to but you know we don't know we had access to additional data you know maybe it's you had a headache and that's why you showed up to the doctor that day but what causes that headache or you know maybe it's things around pregnancy or you know you had cancer or other things like that we don't have that data today your retinal images. Um, and that, 
right? To build out this AI, we need high quality images and we need it annotated with the right data and metadata. And so what we've been thinking about is this problem in eye care. So as I mentioned earlier, eye care Characters. You know, these retinal cameras haven't been, these uh, mobile retinal cameras haven't been deployed yet. You know, they're, they're not something that's easy to use, um, the ophthalmoscope. And then on the other side, we have these large desktop cameras that are very limited in scope and in only being present in optometry and ophthalmology's offices. And COVID has exacerbated the situation, right? A lot of people are no longer you know, visiting their eye doctor you know, for their annual screenings, you know, just like it has happened with every other screening. You think about breast cancer or colon cancer, you know, through COVID, these what were supposed to be annual visits just have gone down to basically zero. And, you know, hopefully this year and next year, we'll see those pick back up and doom normalcy. Um, where we've started our hypothesis and thesis has been around in diabetic eye disease. So diabetes and diabetic retinopathy is the largest case of uh, blindness, the largest cause of blindness in human, in working age adults today. And it's completely preventable if it is caught early and, tr and treated. Unfortunately, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of times you know, because it's asymptomatic to the patient. So the patient still sees 2020. They're like, I still see fine. Why would I go see a doctor? Why would I go see the specialist? And that's really where the problems arise, right? When it starts to affect their vision, and then that's when they go to the doctor and they're like, hey, doctor, I'm seeing blurry, I'm seeing red, you know, I'm seeing flashes of light. It's usually too late to reverse the treatment at that point. What we can do is really just uh, prevent it from progressing worse. But had we caught this patient, you know, anywhere from three months to six months earlier when they weren't having any symptoms, but were already showing signs of disease, you know, could have been treated and saved and kept them seeing for the, you know, for, for another long period of life and really improve their quality of life. Um, and so, you know, critical screenings are not happening. And the other part of that problem is that there's a shortage of eye specialists. There's only about one eye specialist for every 17,000 Americans. And so as you can imagine, there are not enough specialists to see and do those yearly screenings with uh, needs. So what has SPEC done about this is what we've created, uh, you know, tapping into this $40 billion opportunity, we've created a platform that enables any healthcare staff to perform an eye exam and we have the eye. So when you hear the word stethoscope, you think of something small that's portable and that's easy to use, right? Your stethoscope is used by everyone in the healthcare industry, whether it's a nurse, a medical, you know, paramedic um, or phlebotomist. And that's really what we've enabled, uh, you know, the health the using this portable handheld C on the left, we're able to provide retinal examinations to anyone. And we've coined this term of eye care anywhere. You're, with healthcare staff, you're looking at nurses and others, there are a lot more of them in the United States and around the world you know, the, in the providers, which you know, gives us a much better ratio of one healthcare staff to every 66 Americans. And by enabling and leveraging this lower cost staff, we're able to really enable eye care anywhere and no longer bottleneck critical screenings. And on the other side of the things, we want to be able to allow our ophthalmologists, our eye specialists to practice at the top of their license, right? So practicing at the top of their license means letting them do what they've been trained to do, right? They went through a lot of school and um, and residency to treat patients, you know, to take care of patients and to treat patients, they're not there to do the screening, right? Ophthalmology is the one specialty where um, today we go to the specialist for screening, right? We're like, hey, I don't know if I have an issue, but I'd like to, to get screened. Whereas with every other specialty, whether it's cardiology, pulmonology, dermatology, right? Looking at the heart, your lungs, your skin. By the time you see the specialist, you already know what is wrong. And your family doctor is able to give you a sense of 
how urgent it is, right? Is it something that like, hey, this is concerning, you should go see a specialist in the next, you know, month or two, or this is, you know, very dangerous, and you should go to the emergency room and get treated in the next few hours. The ophthalmology is the one place where if you go to your doctor today, and you're like, hey, I'm seeing, you know, flashes of light, or I'm, you know, my vision is blurry, they really can't do that first level of triage, and we'll just send you to the eye specialist today. Um, so how does it all work? So the mobile stethoscope uh, is a FDA cleared device that we are that is in the market today. It we are able to do the screenings in under three minutes, um, and so much faster turnaround time, right? As opposed to waiting the eight weeks of doing a, a an appointment with your eye specialist and then going and showing up there. Now, obviously, there's some challenges to that. A lot of these staff, as I mentioned, you know, your nurse, your medical assistant might not know what an image, you know, what a healthy or unhealthy retina should look like. And this is really where our telemedicine platform comes into play. Um, and so we have a specialist that will connect with the device. As you can see, it's, as I mentioned, with some optics. And we're able to really teach the user how to do that. So we'll connect to the phone, we'll tell them like, hey, you know, this is how you hold the device, bring it up to the patient's face, move left, move right, and capture the images together with them, and ensure that the images that are captured are good, that they're not blurry, that they're of the right regions that we want. And at that point, that's it. Um, those images get sent to our back end where today we have human ophthalmologists that will grade the images, um, prepare a report and send it back to the back to the clinic, to the care provider. But in the future, we, are, we will be leveraging you know, machine learning and AI to provide that first level of screening. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of information that is found in the eye, you know, none of this has been approved for the FDA yet. And so for the care provider, the interaction with, with SPECT is very much like a blood draw, right? Where they draw blood, they send it out to a lab, and then they get a report back with the numbers and uh, the results that they really care about. And that's really you know, what we provide as a service. Uh, through the pandemic, you know, we've been able to grow really rapidly in the at-home market um, in, in virtual care as, as with many other practices, you know, patients were not going into the office, um, but wanted to receive the care where they are. And optometry and ophthalmology are one of the ones that suffered because of that, because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the cameras are these big, large, bulky systems, right, to go get your eyes checked, to get prescription, you know, for refraction. Again, you, know, you need to sit in the chair, they've got these big machines, um, and that's not really portable. But over time, you know, this will be something that we're expanding into other avenues today, such as, you know, in uh, physician associations, FQHCs, ACOs, and, and eventually into the payer market. And then, so as I mentioned earlier today, you know, we're kind of in this stage one where the patients need to go see a healthcare worker, the healthcare worker interacts with our telemedicine platform, and then it's reviewed by an eye specialist. Um, in the future, we are working on this in the next, um, next few months is to get this, some of these portions automated you know, using an AI-based grading system, replacing the optics or optometrist. But looking long-term, you know, we see this very much like the blood pressure uh, cuff, right? Where initially the blood pressure cuff only existed in your family doctor's offices and eventually showed up, you know, into the pharmacy, right? Where you can stick your arm into the big machine. Um, and now you can do... You can buy them over the counter, you know, and, and I have one for my blood pressure, but that doesn't exist for eye care yet. Um, and so here at SPEC, this is kind of where we envision, you know, really the future of eye care is going towards is today, you know, it's only in ophthalmology. We're trying to bring that to higher care into paramedics, you know, into emergency medicine, into phlebotomy, into labs. And then eventually we can create this, these kiosks where you can go, you know, put your face in it and take an image in pharmacies where you can use it on your own without the need of a trained technician. Um, and then long term, we'd like to obviously see this where it could be where you could just buy it, bring it to the home and use it at home. Um, unfortunately, we're not there yet. These are, you know, there's a little bit of lobbying with the FDA that needs to happen before we get there. But 
but you know just like with the blood pressure cuff that's kind of where we're envisioning the next uh next few years um and you're looking at that large market 10 billion dollars that we're spending today in the eye care market and then in more generally the eye care diagnostic market some 30 billion or more range but as i mentioned earlier right we're not just looking at hair but really the eye and the retina as, as a biomarker to the body so looking at attack stroke looking at neurological risk like parkinson's alzheimer's and many other things that you know today we don't know because we're not measuring it um, and we're estimating that to be a you know somewhere well above 80 billion dollar market um and so, so you know as a to bring this back to the beginning this information, right? How, how do we envision the future of healthcare? How is technology changing healthcare, especially when we look at the eye? Um, we see this as you know, being able to democratize access to healthcare and eye care for everyone. Um, we see this as being able to save vision. There are way too many, you know, American and humans worldwide that are losing their vision today. Um, just because of underdiagnosis, because they don't have access to the right care systems um, and doctors and to, to get this done. And then looking back at this tricorder, right, for Star Trek fans out there, like we want to create this tricorder where you can take an image of the eye and really understand a lot about the patient, um, you know, health and and the conditions that they're suffering. And with that, you'll be able to create, you know, nudges to change our habits, to live healthier, you know, going lives. Um, and so that ends my talk for today. You know, hopefully this has been informational to, to field any questions you have at this time. Hey, Michael, thank you so much for that. That was awesome. So while we wait for questions to come in, I don't think you mentioned where people can connect with you offline or online, offline, online. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, happy to connect with anyone. Our website is www.getspect, so G-E-T-S-P-E-C-T.com. Um, and then, have, you know, and then, you can send me an email, just michael at getspec.com. Happy to, to chat. Awesome. Are you uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, neither, both? Yeah, all of all of the above. Uh, on, I'm LinkedIn. Uh, I, I can. I don't know what's the best way to share that information. Yeah, there, right? I, I'm, if people just, I just want, people can go look for you. You know, I, I, there's not a way for us to do it here, or maybe they can drop, you know, a link. But uh, so while... So I have a question for you. You know, uh, this is something that uh, this in particular, in the field that y'all are playing in, uh, is something that I find quite fascinating because my wife uh, just finished her master's in Braille. So she's a Braille teacher. Mm -hmm. And all summer I learned about the retina. And it's just fascinating, you know, that muscle. I think she told me some crazy statistic about like, the, I can't remember what it is right now, but I'll, I'll definitely connect with you offline about it. But yeah, I think, I think this, this area is such a over, maybe overlooked, underserved. Um, and I think, you know, when you were going through the, the uh, optometrist, when I used to go to the uh, optometrist, optometrist, yes. So uh, I hated that machine that blew the air. I would hate, yes. like, I, I even, even today, I know they don't do it. In, last time I went about a couple months ago, I was like, yeah, dude, I don't have to do that machine. She's like, oh, we don't do that anymore. I was like, oh, okay. I, I just remember as a kid growing up, like, I hate it going, I hate touching my eye, anything that has to do with the eyes. That's why I haven't done LASIK yet. But so I think it's, it's really interesting how much science and technology is able to help us advance. And, you know, I, I know, uh, blind blindness is, is, uh, a big thing, not only in the U.S. but other parts of the world. So um, the opportunity that you know y'all are really shining a light on, on this is is really amazing. So thank y'all for for I applaud you and thank you for the work that you're doing. So no questions have come in yet. Um, my question for you is, 
Uh, what are your predictions uh, in 2023 with technology and innovation in, in your space? Yeah, 2023, you know, great, great question. Um, actually, I just came back from a conference earlier this week uh, called HLTH or health. And, you know, a lot of conversation around like, how do we leverage technology to, you know, to provide better care and kind of where I see my predictions are is, you know, especially in the U S where we're spending a crazy percentage of our GDP on healthcare, you know, this is not scalable and this is not sustainable. And so there's a lot of very interesting companies out there that are innovating in, in many different spaces, you know, beyond eye care, um, you know, on workflow and payments and automation to make the overall industry more efficient. Uh, I think, you know, with the pandemic, you know, we've just been bogged down, right. I was like, I, one of my family members just had to go to, to, to the hospital for, you know, for outpatient surgery, but in the past where you can just show up and, and get your surgery done, you know, now they need to do a COVID test. They're wearing a lot more protection and PPE. And so there's a lot more procedures that have been put in. And as a result, you know, our costs of healthcare are going up. And so this is where, you know, where technology can really shine and, you know, decrease physician burnout, decrease clinician burnout is by enabling them to really focus, you know, the, the, it comes back to what I was saying earlier, right? This is how do we allow um, our physicians and our experts to practice at the top of their license, right? Enable to do what they were trained to do and not ask them to go and, and fill up mountains of paperwork, right? Today, a lot of your physicians, even your family doctor, you know, physicians, like, they visit with the patient and then they need to go back to their office and spend 25 minutes, 30 minutes filling out a lot of paperwork, documentation, on what they asked you, what they talked about. And that's just not efficient and no one's happy doing that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100 percent. You know, I, at the end of the day, you don't go to school for, you know, five, ten. My my best friend just graduated as an anesthesiologist. He's been in school like 12 plus years. You know, I'm just like. You know, y'all don't go to school for all that time, you know, to just go fill out paperwork. You know, I, you should be able to do what you do because you are at the highest level. And I think there's ways with technology to, to make that more efficient and seamless for them, um, for them to stop doing all this busy work. Because I feel like most of the time that's what bogs most of us down is all this redundant busy work uh, that could be outsourced to, you know, a technology or a software. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for spending time with us today. Um, any last parting words you have? I don't think we have any questions uh, that have come in yet. Uh, we do have a little bit of extra time if you want to hang out. Otherwise, uh, we will be bringing Dimitri up, who's the CTO of Glorium Technologies, to end. But any, any last parting words for our audience? No, I think this has been, you know, really great time. Thanks for having us, you know, great, all great speakers today. I, I certainly learned a lot, you know, just listening to others and, uh, and I'm excited, you know, as, as you said, I'm excited to see where healthcare goes and how we can really leverage technology. You know, it seems to have a lot of exciting technology that people are working on that we've heard about these past few days. Um, and I'm sure, you know, in five years, from now, the healthcare we receive will be very different than the healthcare we receive today. Yeah, that's exciting for sure. I completely agree with you. Well, I hope you have a great day and uh, stay safe and healthy.